Hello, Health 230 students. This is lecture two of two for chapter 18. We will pick back up talking about modified diets. And um, we'll go directly to that second bullet point there where it says modified diet. And generally speaking, modified diets are ones that are adjusted to the medical needs. That are Another way to say that is they are made specifically for an individual patient based upon that patient's caloric, vitamin, and mineral needs. And, and I'm gonna throw protein in there as well. Um, because providing an adequate amount of protein is very important, in particular the essential amino acids that a, a patient's body cannot make. And I, I, I shouldn't say patients, no, none of us, no, no, no human being has the ability to make those essential amino acids and they're very important in the recovery of most people who are critically ill. In table 18-4 you see examples of modified diets. Uh, let, let's skip down to the bottom first because we're going to talk at length about uh, the, the information you see at the top about modified t texture and consistency. Uh, therapeutic diets, that can be very general. Uh, just simply a doctor or a dietitian making a recommendation to, say for example, a card someone who, who has high blood pressure, hey, you need to reduce your salt intake. Well, that would be considered a sodium-restricted therapeutic diet. I, I do want to mention that one. Uh, I, I want to speak to that one at length because uh, we have such a large number of people here in America who are suffering from diabetes type 2. And if you have diabetes for long enough, you, you will have compromised renal function and eventually even renal failure. And considering that we have such a high number of people in society currently who are suffering from diabetes type 2, it's safe to say that as we move forward and um, as these people with diabetes type 2 continue to age, that we're going to see more and more people having renal uh, compromised renal function and renal failure. So uh, I, I think that you're going to see more and more doctors as well as dietitians making that general recommendation that we need to be eating sodium restricted diets due to the the load or the um, the stress that high sodium diets place on place on the kidneys and I'll mention one more thing about that um, if you are eating a lot of canned foods you are eating a high salt high sodium diet uh, the the primary preservative that you're going to find in canned foods and for that matter even boxed foods is, is sodium so you know, it's just one more argument to eat fresh foods uh, in my opinion um, st st steam your vegetables or boil your vegetables it's a much better way of um, of preparing the food as opposed to eating that food out of a can Continuing on with modified diets, mechanically altered diets are ones that are prescribed to patients with difficulty in chewing or swallowing, uh, such as patients with dysphagia or limited abilities to chew. And a really good example that you see on a fairly regular basis in the inpatient setting is it's not unusual to have patients who have either no teeth or very few teeth. And as you can well imagine, uh, those people cannot necessarily eat the food that's on the traditional menu, and the dietitian is going to have to write uh, an order, write a prescription for that per person, for that patient to have a specialized meal uh, so that the person's only eating soft food. Now, that, think about this. It can be very difficult uh, when a dietitian pres prescribes uh, a, a, a soft or pureed uh, menu only um, for a patient because you, know, if you send that order to the kitchen and you have your cooks getting ready to prepare it and think think about the foods that are traditionally soft well you know, they're like the the mashed potatoes um, you know, the corn your your desserts your your highly processed foods. And you know, that's not necessarily what an individual patient needs, especially one that's critically ill. So um, it's not always an easy job for a dietitian to to make an order that meets the needs of a specific patient. Secondarily, it is certainly not easy for a kitchen to prepare the um, the order orders of a dietitian to make sure that that patient is eating the foods that he or she needs to get all the once again the vi vitamins the minerals and the amino acids that that patient needs to be uh, to be recovering 
Table 18-5, you'll see the foods that are included in mechanically altered diets. Um, yeah, that's pretty straightforward. You look over that on your own. Oh, once again, continuing with modified diets, blenderized liquid diets. Then yes, that is a real word <laughs> that you will use in the clinical setting, blenderized. And uh, these are diets that are often prescribed after oral or facial surgeries. And in general, for patients with chewing problems, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's taking normal food and, and blending them up so that they're soft. Now, there are some foods that should be excluded from blenderized diets. And, and maybe a better way to say that is um, if someone has an order to eat a blenderized diet, uh, you, you as a clinician, you want to make sure that that, pa that patient is not eating certain types of food. Uh, you know, somebody might come in and leave some nuts or some dried fruit or you know, seeds, that, that, kind of, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, these individuals should not be eating those types of food. So it is your responsibility to make sure that you know, the, the visitors are, are not bringing, bringing those types of food in, or if they do bring the food in, that you, you basically give some nutrition education or nutrition counseling to that individual to say, you know what, it, it's probably not a good idea to eat this food. Some patients will be ordered a clear liquid diet and these are going to require minimal digestion. These are often given to people after gastrointestinal distress. Uh, I have a good friend who, who just had a portion of his, his colon removed, and um, he had been suffering from ir irritable bowel syndrome for years, and finally just decided, you know what, let's do something about it. And um, for a period of time after he had that performed, he was on a clear liquid diet. And I'll let you read down through the there. As you can imagine, uh, the clear liquid diet is pr pretty straightforward. It's exactly what it sounds like. And the, the, but the problem, well, once again, the problem is, is uh, on the preparation side, uh, the kitchen's making sure that they are preparing those clear liquid diets appropriately, so that an individual patient is getting. I hate to, hate to be like a broken record, but making sure that the patient is getting all the vitamins and minerals and amino acids that they need based upon their specific condition. And of course, specific conditions do vary from one person to the next. Uh, you need to know full liquid diet. That's something else that you're going to hear. Uh, that's, that's not limited to clear fluids. And, and this is a transitional diet between liquids and solid food. May include milk, eggnog, cream, really anything that's liquid that's not necessarily clear liquid it can be included in that full liquid diet. There are also fat restricted diets for people that are suffering from malabsorption issues. Um, also, people who have um, have major heartburn issues, reducing that fat is going to help. And a lot of people don't realize this, but it takes the stomach a lot longer to break down fat, so it stay, the food stays in the stomach longer. So as you can well imagine, if you're suffering from heartburn, a way to minimize that is to eat a lower fat diet because gastric empty, emptying occurs faster when a person is on a low fat diet. One more diet that I will mention that is uh, somewhat common You'll see there the last bullet point um, under fat-restricted diets sometimes limit lactose or dietary fiber. L lactose is the one I want to focus on. <laughs> very, very seldom do we have to limit dietary fiber. Um, actually, I don't think I've ever, uh, I've ever known a patient that had an order to limit dietary fiber. But um, you will sometimes, uh, of course, have people who are lactose intolerant. You have to come up with a diet, or the dietitian has to come up with a, a menu. And uh, really, I guess I should say that the kitchen has to come up with a menu that provides minimal amounts of lactose. Fiber-restricted diets. Yeah, I'm just going to read this because I have never been exposed to someone who who needed a fiber-restricted diet, but they are recommended during acute phases of intestinal of some intestinal disorders. They can be used before surgery to minimize fecal volume and after surgery during transition to a regular diet. I, I, I do not know when this would be appropriate. I remember I am not a doctor. Um, but um, you know, usually after surgery, you know, they're, they're wanting to do everything they possibly can to keep the fecal matter soft so it's easier for the person to go because oftentimes 
anesthesia will, will, will cause constipation. But um, apparently somewhere for some conditions, uh, restricting fiber is a good thing. Uh, you, you'll also at times see orders for low residue diets. Now this is usually going to come from um, a gastroenterologist um, before a person has a, a colonoscopy uh, they have to eat a very specific diet and sometimes uh, the doctor will make sure and tell the person yeah you need to make sure that this is a, a low that you're eating a low residue diet and um, th those are just diets that that are going to help minimize the residue that's left on the lining of the intestines so that the, so that the, so that the doctor can get a good look Sodium restricted diets, we talked about that already, and uh, these are primarily used to prevent or correct fluid retention issues. And this is restricting sodium in most cases to about 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams a day, and may be further restricted in hospital settings. Now, <laughs> you may you may see that number 2,000 to 3,000 and think, wow, that's, that seems like a big number. Um, I assure you. 2,000 to 3,000 milligrams in a day is not much salt. And if you are eating a traditional American diet, uh, you are, are probably ingesting 10 times that amount of sodium. Uh, I mean, really, you, you could go to a fast food restaurant, and, and as you can well imagine, fast food restaurants have and their foods have a lot of sodium in them because it serves as a preservative. They want to maximize the, sh the shelf life of their foods. And um, you know, it wouldn't be unusual to, to get 5,000 milligrams in a meal at a, fast, at, a, at a fast food restaurant. Modified diets continued. Um, some patients, especially ones who have had acute trauma, require a high-calorie, high-protein diet. And luckily, these are, these are pretty easy to to administer, having the person eat, eating a blenderized meal or you know, something that's, that's milk, um, all of these are going to do a pretty good job of providing the essential amino acids that are needed for healing. And you know, the, the, you'll notice the last two there, boost or ensure, those are good examples of the type of food that someone is going, going to be prescribed if they are on a high calorie, high protein diet. And like I said, these are pretty straightforward um, on, on what's going to be ordered for a, a high kilo calorie diet. Feel free to look down through there. Now tube feeding, this is, a, uh, this is quite a bit different and if you've never seen it, you may very well want to go out on YouTube or, or Google it and um, see what a tube feeding apparatus looks like. And um, th these people are, are being fed a formula, uh, not dramatically different than that of a, of a baby formula. And it is delivered through a tube that is placed directly into the stomach or the intestine. A syringe of some type is used to inject that food into the tube. And this is, of course, going to be used when a patient is unable to eat, but may be able to digest food and absorb nutrients normally. When people are very chronically ill or, um, say for example, are in a coma, uh, IV feeding is necessary. Uh, that's also referred to as um, parenteral nutrition. Uh, you, you're probably just going to hear it referred to as IV feeding in most clinical settings. Uh, these are going to be used when a patient's medical condition prohibits the use of the GI tract to deliver nutrients. And that's not the only case when a person just literally can't eat. Um, physically, uh, that, that may very well be used as well. NPO, you're going to hear this one a lot. Uh, NPO stands for nothing by mouth, and it's, um, it's, it's an order to give a patient nothing at all. That the, food, the, the patient cannot eat anything whatsoever uh, orally, uh, and um, that, that includes beverages. And these sometimes are used if a person is going to have some type of x-ray or some type of scan to get the food out of the system so that you can get a clear image of the gastrointestinal system without having to worry about food being in there. Happy studying!